Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and I am the Graduate Admissions Counselor for the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program here at Bushnell. Um, if you're here tonight, you've probably received an email from me at some point. Um, if not, you will likely in the future. And I am just here to be your host for the evening and also to be a resource afterwards. So if you have questions that come up after tonight or um, if you decide to apply and um, have questions about that process, I am here to help walk you through that. So don't hesitate to reach out to me at any point. Um, we are all really excited to have you here. This is actually our first virtual info night for the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. And um, excited to have you join us and share about what we're doing here. So I will go ahead and get this started by introducing you to Associate Dean of Psychology and Counseling, Dr. Ryan Melton. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna have, I'm gonna do a short presentation just on the clinical mental health program, um, but hopefully give you time to ask questions that you may have. And certainly if we do run out of time, I'm gonna make myself available, as I know the other faculty in the department that are joining us tonight would make themselves available for any questions that you would have going forward. So I'm gonna just get started into the brief presentation. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. We also, we also have some uh, financial aid advisor joining us this evening as well to answer any questions you might have about that. So share my screen and get going. It's nice to see you all. Thank you for spending your evening with us. Excuse my settings all set. All right. Yeah, so you're obviously here to learn about the clinical mental health program at Bushnell University. So that's what we'll be talking about this evening. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about what we teach in the program. I'm gonna give the faculty who are here a chance to introduce themselves and what their specialties are so you can start to get to know them. Talk a little bit about your, what your future career might look like in clinical mental health counseling and what do you do with a degree like this? And then yeah, a little cost benefit analysis and. We also have a current student on the line that will share his experience as well. So that's our basic agenda for the evening. You know, um, I, I mean, you may all be familiar with kind of Bushnell's overall mission, you know, as a university that fosters a wisdom, faith, and service. And we certainly think in our program that we add to that overall mission of Bushnell University. Our specific program mission is, is to prepare really culturally humble and, and and inform mental health counselors who integrate current evidence-based interventions and techniques with clients to foster their wellness outcomes and relationships. I'll tell you more how we, how we do that. I do wanna make you aware of our Facebook page that we have active, and so feel free to join that. In this particular lecture, I'm not gonna make you put your phones away. If you wanna join, follow that page right now, feel free to, to do so. Um, and we can have uh, Rachel share that link with you as she, as she emails you. So you can, you can follow us and see the, see the exciting things that we're doing in the program. We're actually quite proud of, of everything that we do. Uh, probably, it's really important to know who, what makes up this program. I've already been introduced as the Dean of Psychology um, and, and Counseling. So we have our administrative staff and academic advisors um, that are all part of our, our group. Looks like someone's joining us now. But uh, I also want to introduce our, our faculty and the kind of the core faculty of, of the program. Uh, Dr. James, I'll introduce him. He is, wasn't available this evening because he's doing what he does best, best and that's teaching a class. So this is an evening program, so he's, he's doing that. But we do have a couple of faculty here with us. One, uh, Dr. Kaj Keji Wint is, is here, uh, and uh, Mindy Barda, who's our field work and clinic co clinical or clinic coordinator. Uh, she's also here. Uh, we have just hired a new factor, faculty, Dr. Julie Learwick, 
who kind of has an expertise in working with pediatric clients, specifically those who have been hospitalized with kind of serious medical conditions. That's where the most of her background is. So she's kind of a nice tie into to hospital work. But I do want to give the faculty who are present a chance to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Dr. Kaj, if she could just say a little bit about the work that she does and yeah, kind of her role with the, with the CMHC department. Thank you. Dr. Melton, hello everyone. My name is Kaj Kajwint and um, my specialty and research interest is in trauma, specifically combat related trauma, uh, women's trauma and military women trauma. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, so, which means I also work with families and couples specifically. Uh, I also work with children and children with history of uh, trauma, such as sexual abuse. <clears throat> Uh, I teach a lot of courses here, and I can't quite remember uh, all of them. Did you want us to, to list the, the courses you teach? I don't think you have to. I think talking about your background is great. So, uh, <laughs> if there's a favorite course you have, you're welcome to talk about that. I do. I do have a, two favorite courses. One is the trauma course, of course, and uh, the other one is the family systems counseling course. Yeah, I think we're really lucky to have uh, Kaj on, on faculty with us. It's kind of given her background in, in a marriage and family and couples counseling and that type of work. Sometimes that's rare for a counseling department to have that specialty. So yeah. really, really honored to have her. It, it allows us to kind of expand your skill set um, as, you, as you move the program. Mindy, would you like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Hi, everybody. My name is Mindy Barta. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor and also proud graduate of the program. Um, I'm a bit biased in obviously our work here. Uh, one of my main roles is to direct our on-campus clinic, which I believe really sets our program apart where we are able to serve community members in the area and really help you have direct client experience um, as you go through your program. Also really connected in the community as the internship coordinator and then a small teaching load, which is usually around supervision and helping relationship right before you enter the um, counseling, counseling room. Um, my background's in community setting um, at Christians as family advocates. I still have a caseload over there and um, yeah passionate about the field. So thank you for being here this evening. So Mindy is direct evidence that our graduates do get jobs. So that's, that's, that's one, one positive outcome right there. Uh, another uh, member of the faculty that couldn't be here this, this evening was Marcy Maha. Uh, she's actually a, our student representative. One thing we really value in our department is kind of creating, creating a culture of feedback you know, that students really get to let us know how we're doing. And one way we help facilitate that is to identify a student representative who does regular student surveys and really acts as the voice of the students, you know, to, to the faculty. Um, everybody's email is, is up here, so feel free to reach out to any one of us, again, if you do have follow-up questions uh, about, about the program. I'll tell you quickly about myself in terms of some of the, my research. Most of my work is in more significant mental health, health, health concerns. So I teach the diagnosis class, a diagnosis and pathology course, uh, sometimes research methods um, and uh, the assessment courses, a lot of the courses that, that, I, that I teach. Uh, so and I've, again, my primary interest is identifying mental health disorders in, in adolescents and early adults so we can really curb the consequences that oftentimes come with these major diseases like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and, and depression as among, amongst others. Your goal in this program is to have the license that Mindy holds you know, and that, both, that I also, also hold. Uh, which is to become a, a licensed professional counselor. Um, and then how to do that is we, are, we meet all the requirements for the state of Oregon and all states actually, because we are a KCREP accredited program, which is kind of the gold standard in uh, 
clinical mental health counseling. So it makes your, your degree quite transferable. So if you don't stay in Oregon, that it's, it's easier when you go to a K-CREP program to, to transfer your, your degree to, a, to another state in terms of moving towards licensure. But how we're gonna get you to licensure is get you through all the required educational courses and then really move you into that field work experience that Mindy really guides. You know, I think that's the kind of the heart and soul of the work that we, we in the clinical mental health program really do is when you really get to sit with, sit with clients. So we, we're going to help you, help you get there. Good portion of that work will be in our clinic. We're very proud of our clinic that we have on, on, on campus, uh, where you'll work and see members of the community, uh, students at Bushnell, um, sometimes family members in, of, of students may, may also may also come. So it's an open clinic where one of our, we feel part of our, our mission is to really kind of serve the community and really feel, fill some of the gaps that exist in the community in terms of a lack of mental health, some lack of mental health care, or long waiting lists. Um, so we have a, a pretty, pretty robust clinic and see a wide range of clients in, in this clinic to really give you a, a good experience before you move on to your internship, which, which means you'll be, working um, in the in the field under supervision there and then getting supervision from us while you're while you're there so kind of move you through that that process we also offer the opportunity to take the licensure exam there is a exam you have to pass to become a licensed professional counselor we offer that that opportunity to take it uh, while you're still a student you don't have to but that is that is available to you um, and then we then we help you move on to getting those those uh, ongoing uh, experience uh, requirements, which ends up being 2,000 hours, and that's, that's uh, done outside of, of the program. But we, we get you all set up to be a, a licensed professional counselor. That's really the goal. Here are our courses, and I could spend a lot of time kind of talking about them, just give you a sense of the courses that you will be taking. We offer courses on professional orientation and ethics that really is specific to what's happening in our field. Uh, courses on social and cultural diversity, human growth and development, career work, uh, counseling and helping relationships. Mindy teaches that course, and that's really the course where you really tone or in fine tune, sorry, your, your counseling skills. I sort of teach a group counseling assessment and, and testing. That's one of my courses where I'll teach you about a series of assessments that counselors do and train you on some really specific ones. Um, DSM Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Diagnosis, um, which is the, uh, the we'll teach you the book that mental health professionals of, of a wide range of disciplines use to diagnose. As a licensed professional counselor in the state of Oregon, you will carry the ability to give a a mental health diagnosis. So you take a lot of pride and make sure that you learn how to do that appropriately. So I actually teach you the gold standard instrument in doing diagnoses, which no other program in the state actually does. Um, and then there's also courses on research and program evaluation. And really hope that if you're interested in research that we as faculty can support you in, in doing that. Kind of talked about this. And this is then from there. After you get your courses, you really move into that field work, that experience, that really uh, hands-on work. Um, again, that's the the work that uh, Mindy Mindy will do for, with you. So you'll do practicum, as I mentioned. Practicum happens at our clinic. In most cases, we do make occasional exceptions, but that happens in our clinic, um, where you'll where you'll see clients on on the campus of, of Bushnell or telehealth. We really have now set up a quite a quite sophisticated telehealth program giving giving COVID. So we actually, I guess one good thing of, of COVID is that our students are now getting a lot of experience in doing telehealth, doing this type of interaction with clients in an ethical way, a safe way, in a way, and, and integrating how best practices are done in, in telehealth. So you want to get, you're going to get 40 client hours there, 100 total hours. And then from there, you'll move on to, to internship. Um, where that's usually done out in the community at a site such as Peace Health or CAFA, where, where Mindy has, has relationships, the Mission, um, Lane Community College. It's a wide range of, of, of opportunities for you to work in the field. Mindy, how many uh, sites do we have uh, where we have contracts or agreements with approximately? 
Mindy likes us to read her lips. It's it's a fun game we play. So. 32 um, <laughs> and <laughs> counting. <laughs> I was taking a bite. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh. All right, so 32, so 32 sites where we have a, a range with, and I know that Mindy's meeting with a few more in this upcoming week. So lots of different opportunities, really diverse opportunities for you get, to get experience in the field. Uh, we also really want you to be involved in the profession. Um, it's one of our KCREP standards. So we actually have a nice uh, honor society on campus, probably one of the more active honor societies that we've seen that you could be a member of, they're doing, actually tonight, they're uh, doing a presentation uh, which includes a panel of professional counselors in the field, so allowing our graduates to talk to them and get some tips on starting their own business um, and other, other work opportunities. Kaj kind of is our liaison to the Oregon Counseling Association, um, so she's been doing a nice job of keeping us connected to that association. Our goal really in the next year as we're starting to hopefully bring people back in, in person is to have students attend conferences. We did that a few years ago prior to prior to COVID and really get involved in the local associations. Uh, we on you have two types of mentor, mentors or advisors when you join us. You have your academic advisor, Cami Hatling, who wasn't able to join us this evening, but she does all of your scheduling and she is on top of it. So she'll make sure that you're setting the correct courses as you, as you register. She'll help you problem solve if uh, you get through an internship early and you want to take a different course. I mean, she's one thing I really appreciated about working at kind of a smaller university is just the one on one attention that we can give, you know, each each student as their courses may change a little bit. And then we as the faculty act as faculty mentors to you and we, we, we meet with you throughout your time here, just checking in on how things are going, if, if it's going well, if you're struggling with something, if, and if we need to make any adjustments, really helping you think about what your job and professional opportunities are, um, any you know, again, challenges, I've talked about that, and then really starting to prepare you at least early on for your practicum internship and then your final portfolio, which is really your final uh, project, uh, which is a, a large research a paper and, and community presentation. So we'll be working with you on that early on, or at least you know, prepping you for it. So you know, it doesn't just kind of come at you right at the end. Um, yeah, I've kind of talked about this, but this is the website for the Board of Licensed Professional Counselors and Therapists. And that is the goal of, uh, with a degree in clinical mental health counseling is to become licensed as a licensed professional counselor um, in Oregon. And like I said, if you choose to move to another state, our standard, our educational standards meet um, the meet standards of licensing boards in, in other states. And again, we're happy as mentors to support you with that. If you were saying you're going to move to California and you're wondering what's the licensing requirements down there, so we can start moving you towards that and, and supporting you in, in that way, if that's a, a place you'd want to live. Lots of careers. I think some people sometimes think that you get a job, you get a clinical mental health counseling degree and you're an outpatient you know, counselor in private practice. That certainly is an option. A lot of our graduates do go into private practice, so they open their own practice um, and then see clients and then ultimately bill insurance if they choose to do that. Um, so you certainly can do that as a career, but we, we have students working in hospitals. So this list here I kind of came up with as I was thinking about all of our graduates that we've had the privilege to work with over the last couple of years. So yeah, jobs in hospitals, veteran services, mental health agencies of all kinds, churches, schools, um, you can work in K through 12, you don't necessarily have to be a school counselor to do that. The state in particular is moving towards a lot of contracted work in which clinical mental health counselors are being contracted to work in schools, uh, work in a university, government, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies. Um, you can work as a faculty as a, when you have a master's degree in community mental health counseling, you are eligible to teach at 
um, in colleges, particularly in community colleges, in some cases of universities. Work as a consultant, trainer, do mediation, uh, custody evaluator, career counselors, uh, an advanced case manager, administrators, program developers, several jobs, several of these jobs I've, I've held. So I'm certainly an example of multiple positions you can have, have with this degree. All right, and some people kind of ask, you know, what's kind of the cost benefit of this, you know? And so you want to be upfront with that. Um, 44,000 total cost of the program. That's the third lowest in the state in, with comparable de degrees. Um, and then the average Oregon salary for a starting counselor is 61,000 and the range is quite wide, um, anywhere from 45,000 to over, upwards of 200,000 and even over 200,000 uh, a year if you're if a couple of friends that are quite successful private practice owners who, who do start to push, push that range, you know, for sure. Probably a little bit more rare, but it's, it's there. All right, uh, I want to also just, just take this opportunity to see if Rachel has any additional thoughts, things that I didn't talk about that you're hoping that I did talk about, Rachel, and then give Nathan a couple minutes to talk about financial aid. Yeah, so um, Dr. Melton did a great job talking about the format of the program. I can just kind of mention the the application process really quick and give you also an overview of that. Um, you should have received an email from me that has the application requirements and a link to the free application. So when the time comes that you want to start applying or you're ready to um, think about pursuing this degree, that's the place to start. Um, there's a list of requirements there, like your, you'll do a statement of purpose, you'll submit a resume, um, there's some letters of recommendation, and then also a background check that is part of the um, application requirements. So if you have any questions about any of that or need help uh, um, navigating that process, please feel free to reach out to me. After all of your application materials are um, received, then we would schedule you for the last stage in the process, which would be um, an interview. We will be doing interviews virtually this year and we'll start um, scheduling them in January. And we usually do them every month or so, maybe every other month um, in January until the program begins in the fall. Um, and so after you attend one of the interviews, you would hear back rather quickly from us. We are pretty, um, pretty proud of being able to um, let you know right away and not dangle your future in front of you for, <laughs> for months on end, wondering what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, we would get back to you rather quickly about your acceptance. And then you, would, you and I would work together to um, get you admitted and enrolled in our program. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Obviously, put I'm your sorry. email up there. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kasha. There was a question in the chat about the application. Can it be saved and completed later, or does it have to be done in one sitting? No, it absolutely can be saved um, and submitted later, and you can continue to log into it even after it's submitted in order to um, add additional materials if necessary. Thank you very much. Put Rachel's email and the link to the application up on the on the screen there. Uh, yeah, just really quick too. There were there was a question about about letters of recommendation. Um, so in the application, there is um, a space where you would provide your um, recommenders' names and their email addresses, and it will send them an email automatically. Um, that is probably the easiest for you and for them, but if they would prefer to email me um, individually or if they would like to write me a, a letter and sign it and send it to me in person, they can do that as well. So um, 
however, really just whatever is easiest for you um, and for them, we can accept it in whatever format necessary. Also, someone asked about the final due date for the application. Um, really you wanna try to get your application in by May. However, we do have a rolling admissions process, so we will accept applications um, up until the start of the program. I just don't recommend waiting um, till the last minute. It makes it pretty stressful for you. And um, there are a lot of steps after you get accepted, um, paperwork to fill out and um, steps to get you set up and order your books. And so we don't want you to have to rush to do that. So um, yeah, to try to try to shoot to do it at least before May. Um, and any time between January and April is really ideal. Um, there are a few more questions. Do you want me to continue to answer them or should if we? There, sure, if there are missions related questions, then yeah. That okay, makes sense. yeah. Um, so someone's asking Nathan um, how many applicants per year? per term and how many are accepted. So how many applicants apply to our program each? So we start once a year and that's in the fall. So um, we can get anywhere from 25 to 30 applications per year. Um, and our acceptance is pretty good. We tend to try to work with students as much as possible to make ways for them to, um, to, to join our program versus, you know, creating a competitive environment where we're ruling people out. So um, I don't have the specific acceptance number, but I can follow up with that in an email later on. I think any other, I think that's all I see in the chat right now. Um, I can hang out at the end of the session as well. So if there's questions, um, any follow-up questions about anything admissions related, um, I'd be happy to answer them then. Thank you, Rachel, really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Nathan, you wanna give a quick uh, financial aid overview in terms of what that looks like? I can do that, yeah. My name's Nathan Eisenhower, I am the Associate Director of Financial Aid here. Uh, you probably generally wouldn't work with me. Eric Carrasco is going to be the main counselor you'll work with most of the time, but um, quick rundown of the process. The main uh, thing that you're going to be looking at is completing the FAFSA. If you've been in undergraduate school anytime recently, it is the same application. Uh, they will ask you questions in the, in the process of that about whether you're attending undergraduate or graduate school. You just put in graduate and uh, you get uh, uh, sent to Eric so that he can work with you on setting up financial aid. Um, the main difference that happens in that transition between undergraduate financial aid and graduate financial aid is a lot of the grant programs, the need-based programs, um, go away once you complete your undergraduate degree. Graduate students are not eligible for Pell Grants and the Oregon Opportunity Grant, for instance. Um, on the other hand, they do increase your eligibility for federal student loan funding. So the federal government does uh, help you finance it, if not pay for it uh, in that way. Uh, other things that students, we, uh, some of our students have used to help uh, kind of offset their costs. Um, if you have uh, the availability of, of job retraining from unemployment or um, dislocated worker programs, uh, if you have employer uh, assistance or reimbursement uh, and scholarships, uh, those are all things that can kind of uh, be a part of the mix, be a part of the conversation with you. Um, if you have previous student loans, again, from undergraduate or from some other graduate program, those loans can be put in what's called in-school deferment. So you aren't required to make payments on your federal student loans uh, if you're coming back into school. So that is a really helpful option for, for some people. Uh, those loans, when they go into deferment, uh, once you're done with the program here, immediately go back into repayment. So be aware of that, but that's something uh, to, to think about on the back end. Uh, the last thing I really wanna talk about then is uh, 
once you're done with the program, uh, there are some program, there are some things related to the federal student loan uh, program that would help you in repayment. There is income-based repayment. If you're not getting that uh, $200,000 a year job, uh, mm -hmm. then there are some options. Uh, the, the payment can be set based on what uh, income you do have, and the federal government will work with you on that uh, in the repayment side. Another really great program for students that are interested in this type of field is called Public Service Loan Forgiveness. It's essentially a program where students can have uh, the balance of their remaining loans forgiven after 10 years of repayment. Again, your payment would be set based on uh, that uh, income-based repayment uh, system. Uh, so you'd make your payments for 10 years and that may be the payment can be as low as $0 um, in, the, in those programs. And at the end of 10 years, if you still have a loan balance and you've been along that time working in a public service uh, related field. So working for the state, working in a school district, uh, working with police departments or in the military, all those kinds of things uh, would apply. Uh, then at the end of that 10 years, whatever your balance is at that point uh, would be forgiven. So um, we'd love to have a conversation with you and uh, give you more information. If you have more questions, uh, let me know. Okay. And there was um, a question real quick for you, Nathan. Uh, Carrie's wondering, her husband has student loans, but she does not. Is there a possibility to have his loans deferred while she is in school? Uh, generally, I, that would not work. The only time that that could work, I'd be sort of in that territory would be is if Carrie is the income for the household and her husband, I, for whatever reason, doesn't have income, they could apply for income-based repayment, certify that she's a student and doesn't, you know, thereby doesn't have significant income during that period. And so again, that, that income-based repayment expectation may go to zero. Um, so uh, that would potentially uh, be a way, but it wouldn't be an in-school deferment. Um, that would be, that situation wouldn't apply. Any other questions coming up about financial aid? My email address is up there. So definitely uh, let us know if you have questions after. Um, we're happy to get back to you uh, within a day or so. I also encourage students to look at the National Board of Certified Counselors. There are some scholarship opportunities there specifically for the counseling profession. Um, as our students have earned in the past um, can pay up to 25,000 of, of the of the of the program and then there are the high needs healthcare area grants in in some cases you know usually those are after your license but there's a few that can pay off your your student loans as as you're working some colleagues that are in that program right now okay um i want Brian, to introduce dr melton oh, can you repeat that um the name of the organization again the national board oh, i'm of sorry yep the national board of certified counselors or NBCC, there are scholarships available. They are competitive scholarships, but there are scholarships and we have had students earn those in the past. Thank There's you. a handful of those. There's another resource to look and I certainly think it's worth your time to apply, you know, to write those essays and, and do that. So. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I, again, yeah, and kind of sticking with our culture of feedback that we really value at, in the CMAC program at, at Bushnell, I've invited a current student to kind of give you the lowdown on what his experience has been like. Um, he's an, I invited him just because he was a, an individual that was working in the field and decided to come back to get his master's degree. I think that's like a cool experience. So, I, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Carl Porter. And Carl, feel free to... Tell us, tell them the good, the bad, the ugly. Thank you very much, Dr. Melton. Um, so yeah, as he said, I was in the field before I came in. I used to manage residential treatment homes for mental illness. And then uh, I'm currently acting in the role of a case manager at an outpatient mental health clinic. Um, 
And I transitioned into this primarily because I saw the great work that some of my peers were doing as counselors and really wanted to uh, get into that myself and try to see if I could be having more of an impact than I was as a case manager. Um, the program, like they said, really welcoming, really easy to talk to people and gain information. I uh, talked to Rachel right out the gate and uh, she gave me all the information that I needed after I'd done my interview to get into the program, it was only about a nine day turnaround before I heard back that I was accepted. And uh, as soon as classes started, it's uh, evening classes, one day a week, uh, starting at five o'clock and going until 8.30. So, uh, and that rotates from turn to turn and, or uh, from year to year, I mean, so. I think next year coming up would be Thursdays. That's accurate, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so you'll have about half of your classes will be online and then half of your classes will be in person in those uh, big chunks. It's just one course in the evening. And you go through those uh, courses that Dr. Melton listed earlier. Um, after the first year, you'll also need to fit into your schedule the uh, supervision because as a counselor in the program you'll also be uh, getting group supervision once a week for an hour and a half and then uh, you'll be getting your individual supervision at least during your practicum time for an hour with your uh, campus supervisor as well. After that, um, when you move into your internship though, you no longer need the one hour individual supervision with the campus supervisor because you'll be getting that through your work site. So, uh, but for me, it was actually a really nice process. I reached out to my work site since they have QMHAs and QMHPs and said, hey, I'm going through this program. I'd like to see if I could make this fluid so that I could be an intern at my program. And that worked out for them. And so it's been actually really seamless where I'm able to kind of do my normal work and start working in counseling clients as well. And I do see some clients at the clinic on campus as well, just to get kind of that variety of experience. But overall, uh, the program's really robust. They're, like you mentioned, uh, Dr. Kaj is a, uh, gears a lot toward the family therapy and family systems side of things. And then Dr. Melton leans a lot toward the evidence-based CBT and some of those things. And then the other professors are kind of in the middle in between with different other fields. Um, I know that uh, Dr. James leans a lot more toward the person-centered existential side of things. So getting courses from the different professors, you get kind of a wide variety of different intakes and different ideas of how to approach different clients that have different needs. And that's something that I really appreciate as well as you're not doing everything with just one professor either. So you kind of get a variety of different expectations, different ideas of how to apply APA to your writing and that thing as well, how to do your documentation. So you kind of get a variety in that aspect as well. Um, that's everything that I had prepared to share. Did anyone have any questions for me about what my experience was like or the, what the program's like from my side? Yeah, so um, Sarah asked a question about working, and I, I'm sure a lot of us can um, give feedback on that, but Carl, you are working at the same time as doing the program, correct? And how has that worked for you? Um, I'm not going to say it's totally easy. There's no problem at all, but I will say that it's totally workable. I mean, uh, my work sites uh, have been pretty flexible as far as making sure that on the night that I did have classes, I can leave a little bit early so I can make sure to get to campus. But you usually have, I would say, probably about 10, 12 hours worth of work max each week to do in addition to your uh, work. So but I would say on average, most, most of the courses, it's probably about eight hours worth of work a, re a week that you're looking at between reading and assignments and all of those kind of things. Um, I know a lot of people that have been very successful doing the work and being in the program. I also know a couple of people that have struggled with trying to do both. So I think it's gonna depend on the person, but I think there's definitely ways to make it work. And I know that the clinic or the program is actually really receptive to students that need to taper things down, take a course, you know, 
I can't really deal with two courses at once right now. Can I do just one and then circle back to the next one next year? They definitely do those kind of accommodations for people that are struggling. So, um, and then actually there's something I forgot to mention earlier, but one of the things that I appreciate is I have been in this field for a while. I've been working community mental health for about seven or eight years, and I'm still learning something new in each course. There's a lot of courses that I walked in and I was like, oh, I totally know my ethics because I've been doing ethical stuff in this field for all the time. But every single class, there's been at least a nugget that I really didn't know or that really opened my eyes and made me grow as a person. And that's one thing that I, I don't think has been said about the program yet, but it's not so much entirely about teaching you the material as it is about getting you to grow so that you're the right person to be there for for clients in the future. So while you are learning a lot of material, you're also kind of learning how to apply it to your life, how to grow as a person, how to see things from perspectives you didn't before, and how to kind of use that to help other people. Sorry, did that fully answer your question <laughs> about kind of the caseload yeah, and making things workable? <laughs> yeah, I think that really helps. That's typically my answer is that, um, I mean, people do have different capacities, so it's really hard to answer that question for somebody else. But the program is designed that you're having class once a week in the evening time. Um, so theoretically, there is space there for you to be working um, at least specifically the first year where you would just have class in the evening and um, you wouldn't be doing your practicum or your internship yet. I think where it starts to get difficult, not just with the workload, but also your schedule is when you start needing to see clients um, and how quickly you get the hours required is kind of going to depend on how available you are. Um, and if you're working another job, that might play a factor in that. Um, but we do see lots of people doing it regularly. Yeah, no, and actually now that she mentions it, every single person in my cohort, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, did stay at least part-time employed through the entire first year. And I think the vast majority of us were full-time employed through the first year. I know that that's dropped down somewhat the second year. Um, other thing to mention is that there are required 10 sessions of your own counseling when you're going through the program and I would advise you to take those early um, start getting into your own counseling and working on your own things because some of the classes are going to have things that have a huge impact on you and change you and it's good to have someone else kind of guide you through the process while you're doing that as well were there any other questions for me I think what we have left are just a few general questions Okay. All right. Well, thank you, one. Thank you, Carl, for one spending the time this evening and yeah, giving your 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 purview and your thoughts on the program. You know, so that was a, it's a very nice nice summary. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let's take some questions. So we do have a few um, that we need to address from the comments. Um, one of them was about do we have graduates that go on to PhD programs? We do have graduates that go on to PhD programs. I know we have one current PhD program student or someone who's in the PhD program right now um, I still keep in touch with. Um, yeah, it is an interest of, of several students. Maybe you might be able to chime in on this a little bit more, but I believe there are about six current students that are strongly considering the doctoral studies, at least in counseling. You certainly can look at doctoral programs in psychology. It's a little trickier um, in terms of what classes get transferred and what don't. I encourage you, if you're thinking about a doctorate in psychology post this program, you spend some time with your faculty mentor to, to, to make sure that path is the right one for you and what that might look like. So there are different doctorates, but doctorate in counseling, that's a, a very easy transition. Doctorate in psychology is, is, is doable, but it has, there's a, a couple of things to be aware of with that. Mindy, when, do you want to add anything there? She's... Um, just that my pet project is for us to get our own PhD program. So another <laughs> reason. <laughs> another. <laughs> but yes, yeah, six, I feel like we have enough for a first cohort and growing. <laughs> so, 
So yes. So Mindy, another question that um, might be good for you to answer. Someone asked, or Molly asked, in regards to the internship, if I'm already working in the field, but it's not somewhere you're contracted with, does the program ever make exceptions so a person could continue with the current organization they are with? So that is another gift COVID has given us. Um, if you meet the requirements, meaning that would be having a site supervisor, and you're having direct client hours, um, we'll make up a contract. Dr. Melton and I will typically approve it. And yeah, so that's a possibility. Um, a supervisor is someone who well, holds a master's degree um, for at least two years in a related field. So it could be an LPC, um, program like our own. It could be marriage and family counseling, social work, um, psychologist. Um, is there another one I'm forgetting, Dr. Milton? Psychiatric nurse practitioner. If you're working in the school, maybe a school counselor also would meet that requirement. So that's an example. And then the other requirement is that you'd have access to direct client hours and hopefully recording your sessions. We have a whole program for that. So it would be pretty easy um, in the cases like at the state hospital and court recording is not a possibility. We have a live supervision form so that that potential site would be able to see your therapeutic work. So yeah, short answer, yes, we can, we can probably, as long as those requirements are met, then we can, we can make it work. And another requirement of a supervisor is they have to have some type of supervisor training, um, and we offer that on campus free to them. So we can get them, get them set up for that, for that requirement um, as well. So Dr. Milton, could you speak to the difference of the differences of our program versus a couples and family program. Sure, and, and, and probably Kaj, Dr. Kaj could, could chime in on, on this as well. You know, a couples and family program, uh, which prepares you, which might prepare you for a license, another, a different license, the licensed marriage and family therapist, is gonna have more, is gonna have a lot of similar classes. Uh, I used to work at a university that had both programs, both the CMHC degree and a, uh, a marriage and, and family degree. And, and, and the students crossed over a ton of classes. Uh, so there are classes that you would take. And then there's some additional classes or some other classes that really focus on systemic uh, family therapies and really hitting the, the uh, working with families in a little more detail than we might in, in our program. Um, but yeah, Dr. Kaj, I don't, you, you might, you're probably more of an expert on this than I am. Yeah, the major difference, as Dr. Melton said, there are many different simil there are many similarities in this program and, and systems program, but the main difference is the word systems itself. They teach you to think systemically, uh, to have a systemic approach so that when you're working with a client, you're not just seeing the client, but you're seeing not only the different systems in which the client moves and how those affect the problems presenting in front of you, but also how you look at the problem itself um, and take it back to the very first system in which the, the client uh, exists in it existed in which is the family of origin and then you work out the problem from there so you are constantly thinking from a systemic framework rather than just seeing the client in front of you and dealing with the problem that is presenting with the client alone and not looking at all of the systems that actually affect the problem. That's why we're so, so we have, right, it's so nice to have Dr. Kaj here because she can really, you know, because as a licensed professional counselor, although you don't get the license of a licensed marriage and family therapist, you are, you can still work with children, families, couples. Um, you just, you just wouldn't be a licensed marriage and family therapist. You'd still be a licensed professional counselor, um, but you can still do that. And, and Dr. Kaj is, I've heard wonderful things about her classes and preparing students to work for, work with those with those sets of clients and even in our clinic is, is starting to move in that direction where actually might see some couples and families in, in our clinic and we welcome internships who, are, who do that work as well. So still an option for you, although you would not earn the LMFT degree from our program. And just like LMFTs can also see clients individually, they don't have right. the entire family in front of them, although right. they could. It's yeah. just 
the lens through which you see the problem is different. Right, but yeah, clients are the same. Are, yeah, you can you still can see both, both sets of clients. Mm -hmm. I don't see that we have any more questions in the chat. Okay. If anybody has any really quick that they want to submit, they're welcome to. I will also hang around um, and I'm here to answer any other questions. And if there aren't any more, which it looks like Oh, okay. So is the co is this a cohort based program? Yes. So we have we have one start a year and and you will start with your cohort and you will work all the way through the program with your cohort taking the same classes. Any other last minute ones before we go? Yes, Carrie. If it's okay, I'll just unmute myself. Yeah, and absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Um, I was just wondering how long does it generally take to get through the program? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there is a range. It's, I typically say 28 to 34 months. The program is laid out in two years and a semester, but um, we've given you extra space depending on how quickly or slowly you move through your internship and your practicum. So like I mentioned, some people are trying to work, a, work another job um, and they don't have all the hours to devote to seeing clients. Other people are going to you know, be, be solely available for that. And so they might meet the requirements of their hours before, um, you know, more quickly. So that's why there's a little bit of a range there, but it's, it's laid out in all anything that you've received from me or will in the future for two months and one semester. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, that to? question came in through the chat about, about how many hours is that the year two when you start seeing clients and Carl, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I would go ahead and set 10 hours aside, which would include your time seeing clients, time to prep with your clients and supervision. And then if you're not working and have extra time, you can go ahead and increase that. And I think the minimum would definitely be five and that's like a minimum. Um, I would carve out 10 to even 15 hours for that one class, which it would be seeing clients, practicum or internship. Absolutely. And that might be a little bit less if you're able to do what I am and actually do your internship with your work site, because you can kind of meld some of that into your work. But I would say even outside of that, with me seeing the vast majority of my clients at my work, uh, I, I still would say, yeah, set aside that like five hours at least to see, you know, a couple of clients on campus and have your group, uh, your uh, group supervision. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. We like to talk. We like to hear your voice. Yeah, I have a quick question. So when we're doing the internship in the second year, uh, what time of the day or evening uh, are the internship class or the internships usually done? Because um, I'm currently working, I'm kind of, kind of a nine to five. And if I need to work outside of that, you know, I, I need to do some massaging of my schedule. And so um, evenings would be best. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Hugo. Um, currently, our clinic is open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., allowing people such as yourself, if you're able to get to the clinic around 5.30, see a client at 6 and 7. Um, that is a possibility. And also, as you're looking for an internship that has evening hours available and perhaps weekend. Um, that's another benefit of telehealth as well. I think we've been able to have enough space in our clinic. So we have four rooms and 
um, obviously if somebody's doing telehealth, if they're able to have a private location, maybe at their work or somewhere in their home, um, sometimes it decreases the amount of travel time and being able to accumulate hours that way. Um, I actually had a basically nine to five job and I was the top of my priority in looking for an internship that had hours I could get during nights and weekends. And there are some agencies that would love to have you. The actual internship group though, the group supervision for your internship is currently a little earlier than that, but I understand that that does sometimes change term to term depending on who's doing it and what the needs are. Right. Support. Yeah, we try to get a sense of what the students needs are and then we have to balance out with the class schedules and everything else, but some do will start at, you know, 3, 3.30, 4, 4.30, so it could be a little massaging you might have to do to get to some of those group supervisions. I have a more general question about the program itself. If yeah. that's okay. Um, so given that Bushnell is a Christian based um, university, how does that inform the teaching of, you know, some of these things that as a counselor, you would come across that are going to be not um, maybe fitting within what values the, the Christian organization. I think what I'm trying to ask is, are we taught how to deal with all kinds of things, even if they don't fall within the values of the, the Christian belief system? Yeah, I can answer that. And then Carl, as a student, you can share that as well. Um, we are a Christian university, and uh, as a Christian university, we welcome everybody. And our program is very diverse. We have people who are Christian, we have people who are non-Christian, we have people with different faiths, and we have people who identify as atheists or agnostic, and everything in between. And as we are training counselors, uh, we train counselors to work ethically with our clients, right? And so some uh, will choose to go into faith-based counseling and that's fine. Others will go into community mental health and serve their clients as, as Carl is already working in community mental health. Um, you know, they will go and serve clients there. Uh, some go straight into private practice, but we welcome everyone. We teach the standards. We're training counselors. We're not training Christian counselors. We're training professional uh, licensed counselors. And so we make sure that as you get out of this program, you're ready to serve anyone and all voices are welcome in the classroom yep. and what i'd like to add on to what dr kaj said is in the multicultural course one of the focuses beyond just racial identity and things of that nature is also spiritual identity and making sure that we're not enforcing beliefs on other people as well and taking into account that our client may have a very different belief system or may have very adverse reactions to Christianity, the dominant religion in the US because of negative experiences they've had. And then beyond just being taught how to work with people of all sorts of different faiths and backgrounds. Uh, additionally, I've found personally that all of the staff that work at Bushnell have, uh, if you're doing individual supervision or have an individual question, if it's not something that you're taught to deal with, they're very open to talking about whatever subject's gonna help your client. So I have had a few things that we weren't necessarily taught about, and that was maybe a more taboo subject that I pulled a professor aside for individual supervision and said, hey, I've got this question. This is my feelings. What are you thinking? And everyone's very open to helping with that. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking the question. It's an important one. I think that we might be out of questions um, at this time. So I just like to remind you that I am available via email. We can also set up another time to chat individually. Dr. Melton has put his email address into the chat. So uh, you're welcome to reach out to him. 
Um, if you would like to speak with anyone else, um, I can also provide their contact information, whether it's me, um, Carl, or Dr. Kaj. Um, and with that, I guess we'll end our night. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I feel like we covered a lot and hopefully we've got all your questions answered. If not, um, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Have a good evening.